So it's very, very important if we want to actually get stable humus, stable carbon in the soil, is that we have mycorrhizal fungi. What kind of practices are, do we currently use that might have an impact on mycorrhizae? Plowing, tillage, fungicides, yeah, there's a good one. Soluble salt fertilizers, all of these things that are common practices are incredibly detrimental to these guys. So it's not actually the roots of your plant that are seeking out nutrients. N roots are actually working as an anchor and they'll be there to take up water. It's actually the mycorrhizae that are out there searching for those nutrients. And they exchange that with the plant for sugars. So they have a symbiotic relationship. The plant goes, here's some sugar, go and get me some phosphorus. And that is what the fungi will provide. The increase in surface area is phenomenal. 900 times the surface area of oak trees and 10,000 times the surface of that root zone for corn, right? So you're thinking there's this huge capacity for that plant to take up more nutrients and more water. So we shouldn't be putting anything on that's going to be negatively impacting on these guys because that's going to affect your bottom line. For real. All right. <laughs> so protozoa, these guys are the smallest celled animals, organisms. You put, oh, I looked at these at fifth form, yeah? We looked at paramecium. There's three main groups, your ciliates, your amoeba, and your flagellates. And they're integral in this nutrient cycling because the, the bacteria have got the nutrients, but they hold them in their bodies. And as far as we can tell, bacteria will live forever. It doesn't seem to be, uh-oh, I'm getting old, I'm going to die. They will only die when something negative happens in their impact um, in their environment or they're consumed. So the protozoa actually come along and consume the bacteria. When they do that, they often take up too much nitrogen because they have different carbon-nitrogen ratios in their body. And so they have to excrete that nitrogen back into that root zone. And in that process, they also excrete nutrients in plant available forms. So we need these guys. <laughs> so ciliates, this thing is funky. They're quite big. You know, we're talking about 200 microns under a microscope. So when you're looking through the microscope, they can whiz through and give you a real fright. They're called ciliates because they have cilia, like these hairs. And um, often when you see a lot of these, it actually means that your soil has gone anaerobic. They're facultative, which means they will go aerobic or anaerobic. They can live in both conditions. These are little dots with long tails. They look like sperm, basically. So they, and they wiggle all over the screen. And those are your flagellates. So these are another important protozoa. And these are the amoeba, which ooze. That whole thing's an amoeba. And it oozes like snot kind of sliding across here. Yeah, screen. And they will consume a variety of things. They will consume other protozoa, bacteria, fungi, the whole thing. Ah, here's this photo I wanted to show you. How cool is that? Yeah, so this is a root feeding nematode. The fungi here has produced sugars that smell like a root zone. They actually put out the same sort of sugars. The nematode comes along and goes, oh, yummy, a root, I'm going to eat that. And when it slips its head in through these nooses, the noose um, is full of water and it basically expands at a nanosecond and it captures these, uh, these nematodes and they become part of this cycle. <laughs> I think that's cool. <laughs> All right, so. Nematodes are fantastic. They will eat bacteria, algae, fungi, protozoa, each other. But what's interesting, and this has happened in science a lot, is a lot of the funding research has gone into which are detrimental and what are causing diseases. Yeah? So when people think of, of nematodes, you generally think of root knot nematodes, detrimental root feeding nematodes, instead of actually a whole lot of them are beneficial. Yeah? Only, I don't know what the percentage is, 15, 20% of them are actually detrimental. And if you've got the good nematodes in that soil, what they'll actually do, and they've seen this, um, I've seen it on a, on a little film, is the nematodes will actively defend against root feeding nematodes in that root zone, like bodyguards. They'll stand there and they'll actually protect that root zone from those um, root feeding nematodes. They're also very important in the phosphorus, nitrogen, sulfur cycle. All those anions are actually recycling it, which they release during their digestive process. You guys can ask me questions, but not hard ones. All right. <laughs> Is that okay? So, nutrient uptake by roots. We've always, it's, uh, until recently, it's almost like plants were treated like they were in, oh, now I've lost the word, hydroponic kind of conditions, yep. That you put on your soluble fertilizer and the plants would just take it up. Yep, that there were concentration gradients, or there were pumps, or there was something else going on that basically we just had to give them soluble nutrients and the plants would take it up. And although we have known for quite a few hundred years 
that the plants are actually exuding sugars out of these roots. They will exude a third to a half of the sugars that they produce from photosynthesis out their root zone. And you think about how hard a plant actually works to collect those important sugars, works very hard for photosynthesis and yet it's pushing it out. Yeah? And so on here you can see these, these kind of bulbs is actually the sugars being pushed out. Yeah? And this is where all our soil, this is where all the soil organisms are living. This is the concentration of these different creatures. So Elaine Ingham talks about biological succession, that soils change with time. Yep, if you go from bare rock, that there is an evolution that happens. So if we have just bare soil or bare rock, what is the first organism that you see? Lichens, excellent. Yep, and then what happens next? Mosses, yep. Blue-green algae, yep. And then what happens with time? What do we start to see? Yep, so we get some grasses here. Before we even get the grasses, we get something else. Ferns along here, back here. Before the grasses, if you're on the side of a roadside and you see you've got a whole lot of gravel and disturbance, what is it that starts coming in first? Weeds. Weeds. Weeds is the magic word. <laughs> Weeds will come in. All right, we have a timeline of plant species that will start to come in. But what we've now found is, at the same time, biology are actually getting in there first. Yep. Bacteria will land on those rock surfaces and start to produce exudates in those slimes before even the lichens turn up. And the cyanobacteria, so there's bacteria that get the energy from the sun. So they actually start working away at those rock surfaces and then with the plants they start to form soil. Yep. And so this happens with time. And so then these soils start to develop, you start to get profiles and we start to see a whole lot of biology. So. This is, um, Elaine Ingham put this together, this is Soil Food Web Labs, if anyone hasn't had a look, have a look at www.soilfoodweb.com, yep, very interesting stuff. So what you find is that at the very beginnings and very basic primitive soils, we're very bacterial dominated and as we go along with time, you start to get more fungi come in, because the fungi are very susceptible to disturbance. So if we're saying bare rock here, what kind of things do you think, we're talking about disturbance, what would disturb a soil so bacterial? Could be natural or man-made. Yeah, erosion, earthquakes, glaciers. Yeah, animals. animals. Yep. There's all sorts of ways that we have of pushing soils back to primitive, primitive forms. Okay, which makes your soil more bacterial dominated because it does take out that fungi and it takes out those higher predators as well, the protozoa, the nutrient cyclers. As we go along with time, it's about when we're at the prairie grasses, which is the, the grasses that we're farming for, that we start to find a one-to-one -one bacteria to fungi. And we talk about biomass, because you might actually only have one fungi in there and this much bacteria, but we're talking about mass. Because what's the largest organism on the planet? Fungi, yeah. Yeah, bigger than a blue whale. All right, and then as we start to go through more and more, these soils start to develop more and more fungal and become what they call fungal dominated. Yep, you think about this kind of stuff that's in this box or going into old hardwood forests and, you know, just taking a great big whiff of all that lovely fungi. Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about? That's that same idea, okay? So just that we're getting more fungal dominated systems. So if we have a weed situation, we're having disease pressures, what do you think might be happening in this system? What are we farming for? Yeah, it's going back. We're actually farming for more primitive conditions. If you've got real weed problems um, and disease problems as part of this too, we're actually pushing our soils to more primitive forms. Yeah. And there's some of those disturbance events. So that could be your salt fertilizers, over tillage, pugging, um, yeah, overgrazing, fires, any of these things can actually push your soils back in time. So it's really important that for our microbiology that we have sufficient oxygen, that we have water, because they also need water, food and comfort. But as we're talking about the soil carbon, if we can actually increase your carbon levels in your soil, that gives your biology a place to retreat to and it increases that water holding capacity. So all the biology must be present. <coughs> Talk about well, which one's more important. These are holistic systems, you know, it's an ecological approach, you just don't kind of target one over the other. You can buy really great inoculated products and just put single organisms in. You've really got to address the, the whole picture. And it's not very difficult, I mean, there's, there's foods that you can put on that will feed a wide range of organisms. And what we find is, you don't necessarily have to reintroduce them, you think how hard we've worked to kill and kill and kill a lot of those sort of disease pressures that we have and we still haven't managed to wipe them out, have we?